Hey, heroes. It's time for part 3 of our What If series, Deku's return from a different world to the world of heroes. Brace yourselves for some epic twists. But wait, Deku's not alone, he's brought a special someone with him, and Hero Society is in for a surprise. Before we dive in, hit subscribe and the notification bell so you never miss the action. Plus, check out my second channel, Snuggy Dude, for daily MHA fanfics. Now, let's jump into the adventure, welcome to What If, Deku's Return, Part 3. Shoto Todoroki had never felt such a hurry to get home in his life. After everything he had experienced with his dysfunctional family, he never expected to find a truly important reason to be there. The closest thing to a reason to be there was for an uncomfortable gathering during the December holidays. Unfortunately, these holidays never ended peacefully, and to the family's misfortune, someone always ended up storming out of the dining room, shouting and cursing intensely. Yet, amidst all the darkness, there was always a bright light shining in the wrong place. This light was his sister, Fujimi Todoroki, who had shown a big heart for a family that had not always proven to deserve it. Shoto himself acknowledged it and was tempted to tell her to stay away from them for her own good, including him. However, she had always been there to help in any way possible. For instance, when he fought with Natsuo, his mother, or his father, she acted as a mediator between the parties, trying to reach a peaceful agreement despite being insulted by Natsuo, rebuked by her father for seemingly taking sides, and facing her mother's indifference in the last two cases. An unpleasant experience that led him to suggest to his sister to leave the place so she wouldn't have to endure this. Despite her calm demeanor and charisma on the best days, she also fell victim to the toxic environment of her family and had conflicts with her father on several occasions. Although she wasn't born with the quirk her father had been hoping for among his children, she had an extraordinary aptitude for combat with her ice control quirk. For a while, he had decided that she would study at UA to become a legitimate hero. Initially very submissive, she accepted the rigorous and exhausting training to pursue this profession. However, by the time she turned 14, her training was going to intensify even more to prepare for the entrance exam. Her father's pride dictated that she had to be the best of her generation. Yet, fate once again proved that he wasn't going to get what he wanted. Shortly before the exam, she confronted her father courageously and confessed that she hated heroism and everything it stood for. Mainly because this profession required those who practiced it to have an incessant need to climb a disgusting popularity ladder, whose purpose was to boost the egos of those on it. Her own father had fallen into this, and with that need in mind, had caused much harm to his own family. Moreover, she stated that if she became a hero, she too would fall into the same trap and refuse to be part of the reason her beloved family had been hurt. She hated that profession and everything it represented. Despite having a strong quirk, she refused to take the entrance exam. Then, with determination, she told her father that her dream was to be an early childhood education teacher. Being the person who guides the young through education was her way of contributing to society. Obviously, on that day, her sister and father had the fiercest fight of their lives, and their shouts echoed throughout the property. Shoto himself was present behind the wooden door of the family dojo, observing the outcome. After that, she and her father didn't have a good relationship for a few years and had some intense talks. Eventually, though reluctantly, he financially supported her education at the University of Tokyo to study early childhood education, something for which his sister was eternally grateful. As the only reason Shoto can guess for why she treats her father more kindly, unlike the palpable tension in their adolescent days. Returning to the present, when his sister confessed over the phone that she intended to become a hero like their father, Shoto knew something strange had happened. Seeing her embrace the destiny she had tried to avoid for years was a major alarm that compelled him to go to his home in the center of Musafatu. Regardless of skipping his school responsibilities, his top priority was to get there as soon as possible. Luckily, he knew shortcuts to his house where he could use his ice control to travel at full speed. Of course, he had to be cautious to avoid any suspicion and had to melt his path with every meter covered. Fortunately, he didn't take long to reach the Todoroki residence, where an ambulance was parked at the property's entrance. Upon entering and reaching the family's main dining room, he had the biggest surprise of his life. His father was seated, leaning against the dining room wall, still hyperventilating and babbling incoherent things, while his mother, Ray, tried to assist him with frustration and exasperation clearly reflected on her face. She's married. She's married to that boy. She wants to be a hero. His father said, adding other incoherent remarks. Sir, I recommend you breathe. The crisis has passed, you need to breathe said the paramedic, who was also near his father. Meanwhile, another paramedic checked his blood pressure for signs of a heart attack. His position was in front of the hero. 
At the moment, Shoto concluded that intervening to help his father would mean hindering more than helping, especially because it seemed like an anxiety attack and other psychological issues, so he didn't have to worry too much. There were more important things he needed to focus on, like the visible freezing of the dining room and the fact that his sister had caused a snowfall covering a large part of the place, a trait of her quirk that clearly didn't belong to his. Taking in the whole scene, it seemed so unreal that he found it hard to accept that it was happening, seeing his father so vulnerable with the news of his daughter, the freezing of the dining room, or his sister's sudden decision to change professions. Suddenly, a delicious smell filled his position, forcing him to turn towards the kitchen near the dining room. Clearly, it smelled like catfish stew, something his sister used to cook for him in his childhood, and a taste he would never forget. It didn't take him long to get there, and he finally beheld everything he refused to believe. It was his sister, but there was a significant change in her persona reflected in her physical appearance. She had an unparalleled beauty that could provoke envy in international models. She had fine features and snow-white skin, reflecting a goddess-like status. He could even notice that her age had changed significantly since the last time he saw her. Another striking feature was her white hair, which showed some noticeable traces of a crimson color and was pulled back by a silver headband that slightly shimmered in the sunlight. Surprisingly, she also had a slightly visible tattoo on her neck of a figure resembling a wolf, a distinctive sign of belonging to some organization that took him by surprise, especially because he knew his sister hated tattoos. He had to handle this matter carefully. Additionally, he was drawn to the fact that there was a coat hanging on a kitchen chair, made of fur from a strange furry animal. Unexpectedly, she was dressed as if she were at a cosplay convention. She wore armor covering her forearms with a plate that looked like reptile skin, a vest made of apparent bovine leather, and boots that also seemed to come from ancient times. As expected, she quickly noticed his presence and broke her focus on the steaming pot on the stove. Upon turning to look at him, she stood still for a moment, unable to speak. At the same time, her hand trembled slightly. For a moment, Shoto would swear that her pupils dilated. Fortunately, that reaction was quickly dissolved, and she smiled at the presence of her little brother. Hello, Shoto. Now, she had an air of maturity that reflected experience. He could even swear she was the spitting image of their mother. Suddenly, she dashed towards him at full speed. She was so fast that he didn't even realize she was coming towards him. Consequently, another bone in his back almost fractured due to the mixed emotions. It's you. It's you. Little brother. I've missed you. So many years without seeing you. You're even more handsome than I remembered. Do you have a girlfriend? Do I have a sister-in-law already? Unfortunately for the other girls at UA Academy, he was known to be really dense. To the point that not even his friends could do anything to help him. Fujimi-san, calm down, Shoto said with a slightly choked voice, as he was lifted like a ragdoll. Oh, sorry, little brother. Feeling a bit guilty, she lowered her younger brother carefully while he almost hyperventilated like their father. I didn't remember you were this strong. Breaking ice blocks with your fists in the Crow Mountains gives you an advantage, Fujimi said, making a bodybuilder gesture with her forearms. When he caught his breath, Shoto accepted the reality that possibly everything she had told him was true, including her stay in another world. He didn't have to be a genius to see the enormous physical change in his sister and her slightly altered attitude. Which raised concerns about her experience in that place. Additionally, he had to process the fact that she was married. He never met the guy who pursued his sister. When he did meet him, he would find out what kind of gentleman was up to his own Isan standards. In the meantime, he had to keep his composure and slowly reconnect with what, for her, were years of possible absence. Sister, why are you cooking? Shoto asked, seeing that the stew she prepared when she could for the family was boiling. Before I left for the other world, I made this stew to talk to our old man about a personal matter. He took a while to arrive, and it cooled down, and I never served it properly. And, as I told you, I also spilled coffee on my clothes. Before we could talk seriously, I had to go to the kitchen to heat it up again and clean myself up, and well. Here I am again, she said, once again focusing on the pot. If you want, I can help you clean up the dining room so we can catch up on what has happened to you. It'll have to be later, Shoto-san. For now, Dad needs the stew to calm down from the news that I married Izuku kun. Clearly, he went on an emotional roller coaster upon hearing that name. Especially because it was the name of one of his best friends. His natural, immediate reaction followed. What the hell? How did that happen? Did he go with you there too? Is he treating you well? Shoto broke his sacred seriousness to become the jealous brother. Fujimi couldn't help but laugh slightly, 
finding Shoto's reaction somehow endearing. I'm afraid we must also postpone this conversation, brother. We'll also talk later about my decision to become a hero, since I'm in a hurry and I'm going to serve dad his plate for his crisis Fujimi said, turning off the stove and grabbing a deep plate to serve the stew. Hurry for what? Suddenly, her sister's expression changed from a kind older sister to a terrifying one. One that could intimidate even the bravest warrior. I'm going to beat the hell out of our brother Toya. What? Gradually, she began to relax her expression. Let's say that my clan, the Wolf Clan, has come to plan to assassinate and capture members of the League of Villains. Right now, Toshinori-san, my father-in-law, must be having fun with a foe. What? said Shoto, reacting with increasing strength. Now I'm waiting for Ankoku-san to pick me up to take me directly to Toya, the bastard. Tomura-chan and Toga-chan must be waiting for me where they have the others captured. You know. They're good kids, if you knew them, you'd probably like them. What? Tomura Shigaraki, the villain Toga, the murderer? Who almost killed me several times. His sanity was in danger. Lower your voice a bit, little brother. You almost deafened me, ha 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 she said without getting angry at her brother's reaction, with the plate in hand and going straight to her father. Sister, I need explanations. How can you be friends with the most dangerous villains I've faced along with my friends? Said Shoto, following her. What are you saying? Your friend Ida-san, Izuku-kun, and the others play cards with Tomura-chan, and many times they've had fun in bars or gentlemen's clubs. Obviously, our husband usually asked for permission for the latter, or else we would give him a beating. Our? Now Shoto really wanted this to be a dream. Here, Dad, a stew to bring back your sanity. I also added mandrake powder as seasoning, it'll give it a unique flavor. As expected, his father didn't even look her in the eyes and remained lost within himself. I'll give it to him, daughter, Ray said, grabbing her plate and placing it on the floor. But first, we need to make him react. Meanwhile, paramedics continued helping the man, despite his incoherent responses. Mom, I have to leave for a while, I have to deal with our brother, the outcast. What? She said, surprised. That's why I summoned dad, I'll tell you later. Sister, listen to me. We need to talk. No, Shoto. That will be later. For now, you can join me to watch the show. Suddenly, a voice came from the gem on her wrist. Fujimi-san, Toga-chan informed that the capture phase is almost complete. Just need to pick you up to take you to your brother. Tomura-chan left him immobilized as you requested, ready for you to play with. Fujimi responded, bringing her wrist to her mouth. Yes, Ankoku-san, I'm at home, as you saw in my memories. I'm coming. Then, the communication closed. What was that? Shoto asked, once again stunned. Meanwhile, Rei chose to ignore her daughter's new surprises for now until she found a good time to talk. At this moment, her husband continued to look pathetic for the situation. Suddenly, she looked excited. A ride, brother. If you want to see me kick our brother's butt. For now, she wasn't going to lose sight of her sister. Yes. Suddenly, her older sister's arm wrapped around the boy's neck, and she said excitedly. Fujimi didn't notice her younger brother's denial and hoped that this wouldn't happen. That's the spirit, brother. He hurt you, and he'll pay for it too. When a portal appeared, scaring almost everyone in the dining room, including the paramedics, Shoto mentally prepared for what was coming. So, this is your dear little brother, said the person in charge of taking them to where the troublesome brother of the Todoroki duo, Ankoku Mayai, was located. From how you described him, it was hard for me to believe that the famous UA student, Shoto Todoroki, was your relative. I even imagined him to be cuter and less serious. Meanwhile, Fujimi Todoroki made a slight pout at her friend's comment and crossed her arms in a childish manner. Oh, friend, don't let appearances fool you, said Fujimi to her friend. My brother can be very serious, but when you grow up with him, you know how sweet he is. I used to hug him when he was scared of the dark. That was when he was a child, and I was in my teens. He cried a lot, but it was worth it to see his baby face. I remember he was nine years old back then. Aw, exclaimed Ankoku with tenderness. Who would have imagined that the grumpy guy I competed with in the entrance exam was like that? I still imagine him as a child. Isn't it true? said Fujimi. I wish you were there that time he confused me with our mother. That day, he was playing with. Shut up. This is awkward, interrupted Shoto, 
his face as red as a tomato. At first, Shoto didn't recognize the person in charge of taking them, but when he saw her cross the portal that destroyed part of his kitchen table, he immediately recognized her. It was Ankoku Mayai, his ultimate rival in the UA entrance exam, and, of course, the rivalry had ended with the girl's defeat. He had heard that she went to Shiketsu and had forged a fame that rivaled that of his class, but unfortunately, it was not a very positive fame for heroes and villains alike. After the entrance exam, they had no contact until now. At first glance, it was obvious that his sister and Ankoku had ended up in the same world, and the years had changed both of them, with her now being older than him. All of this left him with a headache, adding more surprises to the day he had. Unfortunately, that was not the only thing he had thought about her. It turned out she had spread the news that there would be an assembly at UA regarding Fujimi's complicated situation and others who had ended up in another world like her. They had summoned their parents and relatives to attend in a few hours. These were news that could clear up some doubts about his sister, but still, it was strange for a girl to deliver the message as she came out of a portal. After that, and an awkward farewell with his parents, they finally set off to go to Toya. Too bad for the confused teenager that the short journey Ankoku assured resulted in a conversation. At that moment, they spoke as if they were best friends, causing Fujimi to share the most embarrassing anecdotes of her childhood with Ankoku. Consequently, she treated her like an aunt talking to her little nephew, something embarrassing that Shoto had to endure until they reached their destination. Although he still found it confusing to walk through a mysterious place for a few minutes. Ankoku-san, what is this? Where are we? Asked Shoto, interrupting the conversation between friends. Fortunately, that was the perfect excuse to stop Fujimi and her embarrassing conversation. So, Ankoku responded gladly. Shoto-san, we are in, which translates in our language as realm between realms. It's a magical space that exists between the realms. It is located in the branches of the great tree and serves as a shortcut between different locations. That's why the landscape and the ground we are walking on resemble branches. Quickly, Ankoku reacted playfully to what Fujimi said. Yes, I was there. Along with Denki-san, Yu-san, and Izuku-kun. You were panicking and clung to the back of our giant friend throughout the journey, ha ha ha, said Ankoku, laughing lightly. Don't mock me. Fujimi exclaimed, annoyed. You still have the audacity to remind me of this in front of my little brother. What the Todoroki brother didn't know was that his brief journey in this place had come to an end, bringing a surprise just a few meters away. Dot 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 what is that? Girls. Something appeared. Shoto said, pointing at what was in front of him. Without warning, Shoto stopped walking and then drew the attention of the two women who were talking. The expression on his face reflected the surprise and fear that a person would experience in the face of the unknown. It was a normal reaction in the complex nature of humans, and he had experienced it beforehand. Suddenly, a portal resembling a door made its appearance in front of them. The door had materialized in the form of pure and sparkling energy, which was visually striking but not reassuring. It was not like Ankoku's portals, whose destination could be seen at a glance, as if it were a clear window. This time, it was a portal whose destination could not be determined just by looking at it head on. He felt that if he crossed it, his fate would be uncertain, as if he were playing his own life at random. From there, he wished that his rigorous training at UA would finally bear fruit in overcoming his insecurity and fear of a simple portal, but he couldn't help but feel intimidated. Meanwhile, Ankoku, seeing that the portal was opening again and that Fujimi's brother might be feeling some insecurity about taking a step forward, approached to ease the atmosphere. She did it mainly to help Fujimi's brother assimilate this new world of oddities that they brought to their homeland. After all, she herself had to admit that she and the clan members did not react differently to what the other world had in store for them. For now, this was the first step in helping Fujimi's brother. Moreover, she didn't want to see her sister in arms worried about her little brother on such a special day. It's okay, Shoto. This portal will take us to the destination that I myself directed Ankoku said, trying to reassure him. Suddenly, Shoto looked at her with an expression of embarrassment. No, I'm not scared. For a moment, Shoto regained composure, and his courage increased exponentially, driven by his pride. He would no longer be afraid and did not want to show cowardice to someone who battled him in the entrance exam and to his dear older sister. Without warning, Ankoku could feel the same protective older sister sentiment that Fujimi had, as she saw this seemingly fearless teenager and couldn't help but fondly remember her equally proud younger brother. So, she spoke to him. You don't have to act tough with me and your sister. As we said, our first time here gives us dizziness, fear, and embarrassment. 
I'll tell you a saying we used in Turheim, even the bravest warrior is intimidated by the realm between realms. There's no problem if you're scared to cross. You should believe her, little brother. She's the best mode of transportation we have, even in this eerie place Fujimi added as she approached the duo. I'm not your aunt or older sister. Thought Shoto, reacting defensively. Although she had a point, he didn't have to pretend in front of them. Especially because they were asserting that there was no problem in crossing. That was all he needed to know. All right, I'll cross. Shoto said with a certain frustration, even though I don't fully understand how this portal that transports us from one place to another works. This pleased both women. Suddenly, Ankoku began to move towards the portal since, by a strange habit among them, she was always the first to cross the portals. A habit that Shoto was just beginning to discover. Your sister will explain it to you later, kid. What I can tell you is that the power of the portals is mine alone, I am the shortcut itself. You'll understand why soon. Also, you should talk to her about the great tree and other things. There's a lot to discuss. After saying those words, Ankoku crossed the portal. Fujimi's excitement intensified, as if what was about to happen next ignited her spirit, and every moment of waiting to cross became torture. It's our turn, Shoto. Are you ready for revenge? Yes. Shoto nervously replied. Suddenly, the ambient temperature dropped even further. The younger Todoroki brother witnessed his sister creating ice out of thin air with her hands, and part of her clothing took on a whitish hue. Her hair momentarily waved due to the cold wind emanating from her, as if she were an ice queen materializing out of nowhere. Come on, brother. It's time to make Toya suffer. Fujimi said with determination and growing anger. Shoto, on the other hand, had more doubts than answers, but for now, he would go with the flow and accept the reality for a moment. Toya Todoroki always dreamed of meeting his father's expectations for as long as he can remember. The reason was that he deeply admired Japan's most recognized and respected hero, despite his demanding nature during training. Unfortunately, Toya couldn't compete with his younger brother, Shoto, who quickly became their father's favorite after manifesting his own quirk. Shoto's increasing attention left little time for Toya, who often didn't train with his father and spent more time with his brother. Additionally, Toya faced another problem at that time. His innate quirk had a genetic defect, making his flames dangerous for both himself and others. Over time, envy and desperation for his father's approval consumed Toya. He began to resent his mother, Rei, for passing on the defective quirk genes. He also harbored animosity toward her for not always supporting their father and speaking behind his back with friends and family visitors. One day, Toya asked his father for training to improve his skills, skipping school and leaving Shoto, who had just started elementary school, alone. Toya saw this as the perfect opportunity to prove himself as talented as his younger brother. However, when his blue flame seemed out of control, his father told him his quirk wasn't suitable for becoming a hero and could harm others. This statement was the last straw, and Toya lost control of his emotions, resulting in a new manifestation of his power. The flames began to spread around him, and unfortunately, their intensity burned him in several parts of his body. Despite his injuries, Toya realized that his father had betrayed his dream of becoming a hero after pressuring him for years to be the best. Toya felt broken and enraged, swearing revenge against his father in the future. Before his father regained consciousness after the blow, Toya left behind part of his burnt garment to make him believe he had died. After deciding to separate from his family and live his own life, he faced difficulties in the underworld, fighting those who tried to harm him. Despite hardships, he emerged victorious. However, over time, he developed a twisted liking for killing innocent people who idolized heroes or young talents from other academies in the country. After several years and eliminating worthy rivals, he focused on carrying out his revenge and decided to join the League of Villains, who became a strong ally for his goal. Although he grew fond of his comrades, he knew they shared the vision that the hero society had created an unjust world. When everything seemed to be going well and his plans were in motion, his friend Himiko Toga and his boss Shigaraki Tomura betrayed them, killing many League of Villains members and capturing many others, including him. After that event, a chain of unfortunate events began, resulting in the humiliating defeat of All for One and Gigantomachia, who believed himself invincible. Not satisfied with the traitors making him witness this humiliating scene, they mentioned that his sister was personally coming to deal with him. At that moment, he couldn't predict what might happen. Although he was a bit skeptical if she could do anything due to her docile nature. When she arrived and greeted their enemies as if they were comrades with high regard, Toya knew his sister was also involved, taking him by surprise. He couldn't help but be shocked, still immobilized by Tomura's strange powers. 
although he was also surprised to see his younger brother, Shoto, equally shocked. So, he assumed that Shoto was also ignorant of Fujimi's involvement. When she focused her attention on him, she couldn't stop looking at him with an expression of deep-seated resentment held for a long time. He knew this because he also harbored resentment towards his father, and now she was expressing it towards him. After a few seconds, she began to speak. Shoto, there was a reason why my father and I were at such an early meal. What is it, Fujimi-san? Shoto asked from his position, separate from Toga and Tomura. At that moment, Fujimi's expression turned grim, and her gaze darkened. Then, she finally clenched her left fist to control the overflowing emotions. This damn bastard was forcing me to conspire against our family, especially with our father. This left Shoto perplexed, although it wasn't a surprise to the League of Villains present, as they had a moment to learn about their friend's past. The important thing now was for Shoto to know the truth. Unexpectedly, with a simple gesture from Tomura, Toyo was finally freed from his immobility. Although it weakened him a bit, he ended up on his knees in front of his sister. Facing his sister didn't mean the young villain was afraid of her, even though she probably had new abilities along with the traitorous bastards. It was then that Fujimi finally did what she set out to do over ten years ago. Say it. Tell our brother how you made me suffer. Fujimi exclaimed loudly to Toya. I can't stand you, Fujimi-san. I could have tolerated you using that brat Izuku Midoriya to get back at me, but you finally decided to use my comrades against me. I didn't think you would break your morals to reach me. Dad will surely be very disappointed in you, bitch. I can't even believe you were his favorite at some point Toya continued, looking at Fujimi with a mocking and arrogant expression. If you don't say it, I will. I hoped you had the balls to at least admit what you had done, but I see you don't. To which Toya responded. Then, tell them. I don't care if I'm judged by the favorite child of dad or by the traitorous scum and their allies Toya said, looking at both Shoto and the other summoned. Fine. Shoto, what happened was. Dot. A couple of weeks before being summoned to another world, I was working normally at the school where I taught. Upon returning to my apartment in Musifachu and trying to enter, some guys ambushed me and tried to overpower me. Although I never studied to be a hero, thanks to dad's training, I at least knew how to defend myself from some, but I had clumsy control of my quirk, which ultimately led me to fall. Then, they entered my apartment and tied me to a chair in my kitchen. At first, I thought they were going to rob me, and that's why they had ambushed me, until I saw Toya entering through the front door.